Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone. Let's get started, even though there's a dude on my balcony. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question. First question this week comes from Iman. Hi again, Iman. Iman says, what is the use of definite article the? We use the with a singular noun to refer to a specific instance of that noun. So when you're telling a story, we'll often introduce the first instance of a noun with a, and then after that we'll use the to refer to the specific instance of that thing. So for example, a simple story. I was walking down the street and I saw a dog. The dog was really cute. I pet the dog. So in that situation, when I introduce a dog in the story, the first time I talk about the dog in the story, I use a to introduce it. Then. After that, I use the to refer to that specific dog that I introduced earlier in the story. Every other time that I want to talk about that same dog, I use the before it. So use the word the when you need to refer to a specific noun or when you have to refer to a specific group. So for example, the teachers in the school district went on strike. So specifically, we're talking about teachers in a specific school district. The teachers went on strike. The mothers at the PTA meeting organized a bake sale. It's a specific group that is defined by something else. So in this case, the mothers at the PTA meeting. Only the mothers that were at that meeting, not the mothers from a different uh, group, for example. So we use the to, uh, to talk about a specific instance of something. Next question. Next question comes from Johnny. Hi, Johnny. You wrote a very long message. Thank you very much for watching. There's a slang expression that I've heard several times and don't understand well. I know, right? Using I know right is like an invitation then for the other person to agree again, really. I know, right? So think of I know right as like an even stronger, like even more emphasis on the agreement and an invitation for the other person to agree again. I know, right? It's like, yes, and you agree too, don't you? Next question comes from Zafar Ahmad. Zafar Ahmad, hi. Zafar asks about two sentences. Okay, one, have you ever cried in a film? Two, have you ever cried at a film? My question is about the preposition in or at. Which sentence is correct? And explain the reason. Of course, I'll explain the reason. <laughs> Let's take a look at the first one. Have you ever cried in a film? Um, this is actually a point where the differences between British English and American English might come into play a little bit. Have you ever cried in a film? Could have a few different meanings depending on the situation. If, for example, you are speaking to an actor and you say, have you ever cried in a film? Meaning, when you were in a film, when you were acting in a film, did you cry at any point in time? So, have you ever cried in a film? It could also mean, have you gone to watch a movie in a movie theater and cried at the movie theater or in the movie theater. Your second sentence, have you ever cried at a film? So using at shows like the direction of an emotion. Like we use it with uh, other emotions as well. Like my mom is mad at me or my dad is angry at me. So it's showing the direction of emotion. So in this case, have you ever cried at a film? Meaning, did a film cause you to cry? Have you ever cried because of a film? Uh, in my case though, if I wanted to ask my friend if a movie had ever caused them to cry, I would say, have you ever cried at a movie? Next question. Okay. Next question comes from Igor. Hi, Igor. Why are verbs like bury, hurry, study, tidy, and try uh, in the irregular verbs list, their past simple and past participle forms have ed endings like other regular verbs. And the course books used have listed these verbs in the irregular verb list. All right, tough question because I did not create the textbooks and I don't know the logic that was used for the textbooks. Um, but if I had to guess 
why those verbs are included as irregular verbs, I would imagine it's because these verbs all end in Y. And yes, although the verbs do end in ED, there is an irregular change that happens with verbs that end in Y. So that's to drop the Y and add IED instead of just an ED. So we maintain that E sound like tidy, berry. However, the spelling of the word changes. Next question is from Poria. Poria asks, what's the difference between these words? Interior and internal, exterior and external. All right, well, there are grammatical differences. Interior and exterior are nouns. Uh, internal and external are adjectives. We use interior and exterior to talk about the inside and the outside of something. But internal and external are used, uh, those are adjectives. We use them to talk about the qualities of something. Next question from Stanislav. Hi, Stanislav. Stanislav asks, how do you politely address unfamiliar women and men? Lady, Miss, Mrs, Mr, and Sir. Ah, nice question. All right. If you're in a formal situation, it's better to use Mr with men. Sir tends to be used more in like a service relationship. So uh, the same thing with ma'am for women. Mrs is used for married women. If I don't know if someone is married or not, a woman is married or not, I'll use miss. Next question. Next question is from Leon. Hi, Leon. What are the differences between test, exam, quiz, and questionnaire? And when should I use each of them? Nice question. All right, let's start with test and exam. We use these two words quite similarly when we're talking about um, tests of knowledge or like examinations at school. We can use either of those. Like I have a test this week or I have an exam this week. I think in American English, test is probably used more commonly than exam or the long form examination. However, when we want to check the status of our bodies, we'll often use the word exam. So for example, a physical exam, that's an expression we use to mean like a full check of the body, which is commonly done maybe once a year or so. So an exam, um, like a dental exam or an eye exam, is a check of the condition of your body as well. A quiz is essentially a mini test. A questionnaire, however, is quite different from um, the three that we've talked about thus far. A questionnaire is something that's given usually to customers. That is for feedback. We use questionnaires for feedback. So those are all the questions that I want to answer this week. Thank you so much for sending your questions. Remember, if you have not sent a question yet, or if you just want to send more questions, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. If you like the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check us out at englishclass101.com for some other good resources. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye! Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Okay, let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Jaya Krishna. Hi, Jaya Krishna. Jaya Krishna says, in school, we call teachers other names like madam or miss. What is the difference between teacher, miss, madam, and other words? Yeah, it's a good question. In American English, in schools in the US that are high school and below, so like junior high school or elementary school, we do not call our teachers teacher. We don't use that title for our teachers. We use Mr. for male teachers, or we use Miss and last name and Mrs. and last name for female teachers. The difference between Miss and Madam and Mrs is usually related to whether or not the woman is married. So if a woman is not married, usually we use miss, or if you're not sure, we use miss. If the woman is married, we use missus. Madam, however, is something that we don't really use in settings like these. We use madam in service situations usually. So we use this particularly in like luxurious settings. So imagine going to like a really expensive hotel and you meet staff at the hotel. They address you if you're a woman or your female companion with madam. So that's like a high kind of um, respect term. So it's kind of an 
old-fashioned term as well. We don't use it so much in everyday speech in the U.S., madam, but you might hear it in kind of like these luxurious, expensive situations. Another situation where you might hear madam used in U.S. English is in situations relating to official positions like in the government. So there's a position, for example, where a, a woman holding the position might be called madam job title. So for example, Madam Secretary. There is a government position called Secretary of State, and if a woman holds that job, we might call her Madam Secretary when referring to her official duties. So that's a very specific case where we would use Madam in relationship to someone's job, but generally when we're talking to somebody uh, in other fields of work, we do not use this title. If you are going to school in the U.S. and you're going to high school or below, just use Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. plus the last name for your teacher. If, however, you're going to college or university in the States, you should use professor if your instructor is a professor or doctor if your instructor has achieved that level of education. If they have their PhD, uh, many professors or instructors prefer to be called doctor, so you should use that title. Of course, some professors also like to keep things casual and they say, please use just my first name or please use my last name, uh, whatever. So pay attention to how your instructor uh, prefers to be called and just use that. Okay, thanks very much for the question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Francois Luzi. Hi, Francois. Francois says, hi, Alicia. Thanks a lot for your videos. Could you please explain the difference between remember remind and recall from a French follower. Sure, so remember and recall have the same meaning. They both refer to thinking of something, being able to think of something that happened in the past. So that could be a conversation, it could be a person, a place, whatever. So remember and recall both have that meaning, to be able to think of that. The difference between them though is that recall sounds much more formal, much more polite. We don't use recall so much in everyday conversation. In everyday conversation, we use remember. Some examples. I can't remember that phone number. Do you recall the name of that restaurant? I can't believe you remembered my birthday. So recall and remember do have the same meaning, yes, but in everyday life we use remember much more often. So please try to use remember. If you want to sound more polite, choose recall. Remind, however, is a bit different from recall and remember. To remind means to cause someone to remember. So you give someone information, like to refresh their memory. They know about something and you want to tell them again. So to cause them to remember some information. For example, can you remind me about tomorrow's lunch meeting? You remind me of someone I knew a long time ago. Did someone remind you it was my birthday? Okay, so I hope that this helps you understand the differences between recall remind and remember. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Win Min Sui. Hi, Win Min Sui. Win Min Sui says, hello Alicia, what is the difference between trust and believe? Okay, um, trust means to be able to rely on something. We feel confident about our understanding of something or someone. So we can trust a person or we can trust a situation or we can trust an object. So to trust means you're able to rely on that thing. For example, it's important to work with people you trust. This computer crashes a lot. I don't trust it. To believe, however, refers to having faith in something, like you are confident that something is true. So we use believe a lot when talking about religion or when listening to people's stories. Like when we believe a story, we are confident the story is true. When we don't believe a story, we are not confident the story is true. So you may hear believe used in the common expression, I can't believe it, which we use a lot when we feel shocked or surprised. So depending on the speaker's intonation, this can mean they actually do believe it, but they're very surprised, or they really don't believe it. So let's hear a couple of examples. I believe hard work is important for success. I got a huge promotion. I can't believe it. 
So in the second example there, that kind of excited voice shows that the speaker is really surprised and really excited. And even though they say, I can't believe it, they're just kind of expressing shock. So it's a true situation. Yes, that condition is true, but they want to express their shock in an excited way. So I hope that this helps you understand the differences between trust and believe. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Maj. Hi, Maj. Maj says, can I say I don't give a damn in an English lesson? Um, I would not say this, no. This sounds very aggressive and rather rude. So if you want to communicate that you don't have a strong opinion about something or that someone else can make the choice, I would recommend something like, I don't have a preference or it doesn't matter to me. Something like that sounds a lot lighter and a lot more friendly. If you say, I don't give a damn, you're probably going to make people upset. They'll probably think that you're being very rude. Similarly, please be careful with the expression, I don't care. So if you say, I don't care, a lot of people feel that it sounds kind of rude again. So slightly rude, not as rude as I don't give a damn. Um, but I don't care can also sound a little too rough. So instead, please use an expression like I don't have a preference or maybe whatever you think is fine. So please try to be polite in your English lessons. Although the expression you used is grammatically correct and it communicates an idea effectively, you will probably upset someone in your class. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's go on to your next question. Next question comes from Zhao Paulo. Hi, Zhao Paulo. Zhao Paulo says, Alicia, you know the video about American convenience stores. Can you explore something similar to the way Risa did on the Japanese channel? Yes, we have started making videos about culture in the US. So this video about the US convenience stores is now available on the English Class 101 channel. I'll put it behind me on the green screen here. Yay, okay, great. Uh, so we didn't explore it. I personally did not explore the channel, but we're trying to think of some other similar things that we could maybe do. So check this out if you haven't seen it already, and also check out the second video in the series about uh, supermarkets in the US, and we'll have some more stuff coming out there soon as well. So we're kind of exploring some culture topics. If you are interested, please check those out. Uh, thanks for this idea. We'll, we can consider it, but we'll try to see how we can work things out. So thank Thanks very much for this idea. Much appreciated. Okay, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Of course, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Today, traditional classrooms are no longer the only or even best place to learn a new language. More and more people are finding that they can easily learn a language just about anywhere they have a few minutes of spare time, including their daily commute to work. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the average American spends over 50 minutes a day commuting to and from work, or over 300 hours a year. But rather than simply sitting in traffic and wasting the time, you can instead use your daily commute to literally learn a new language in just a few short months. Our language learning program has specialized learning tools that you can use on your commute to and from the office to master a language in your spare time. What are some reasons traditional classroom settings just aren't the best option for most people in today's fast-paced world? Difficulty getting to and from class. Learning on someone else's schedule very expensive, and may cost thousands of dollars to complete. Can take years to finally complete classes and learn the language. The simple truth is the traditional classroom instruction is simply not a viable option for most people in today's very fast-paced, time-starved world. Now, let's examine how you can learn a language faster, more easily, and at far less expense than traditional classes, all during your commute to work and back home again. Three reasons your daily commute can help you master a language in the next year. On average, Americans spend more than 300 hours per year commuting. During the commute to and from work, over six hours a week is completely wasted. The time isn't used to help you reach any goals or objectives. 
But thanks to online language learning platforms with audiobooks and other resources that you can access during your commute, you can easily transform wasted time into progress toward learning a new language. With over 300 hours available annually, your daily commute could provide you with enough time to gain significant skills in a new language each and every year. Increase your earning potential while commuting to work. How would you like to transform all those spare commuting hours each week into more money for a new car, house, or even a dream vacation? According to research, someone making $30,000 per year can boost their annual income by $600 or more per year by learning a second language. Over the course of a lifetime, that's a significant amount. How? From work-at-home translation jobs to working overseas, there are many ways to leverage your second language into more money in your bank account. So instead of wasting your precious time, you can make your commute more productive and eventually profitable. The more languages you learn, the higher your income potential. Repetition is key to mastering a new language. Not sure if it's practical to learn another language while commuting to and from work each day? Well, not only is it possible, learning in your car on the way to and from work each day can actually help you learn and master any language quickly. The simple truth is that repetition is absolutely vital to truly internalizing and mastering any language. So, if you listen to audiobooks or even audio lessons on your commute to work and then repeat the same lesson on your commute home, the information is more likely to be locked in to your long-term memory. Our language learning program has been helping people learn and master language in the comfort of their home, during their daily commute, or any place they have a few spare minutes of time. Here are five features of our program that make it easy to learn a new language while commuting to and from work. First, the largest collection of audio lessons on the planet by native speaker instructors. Every single week, native speaker instructors create new audio lessons. All lessons are short, to the point, and guaranteed to improve your mastery of a language. Second, the word of the day. Simply exposing yourself to new information and vocabulary terms helps increase your fluency and mastery of your target language. So every single day, check out the word of the day and memorize it during your commute. It's a quick and easy way to boost your vocabulary every day. Third, daily dose mini lessons. Have a short commute to work but still want to make progress towards learning more than just vocabulary? Not a problem. Our daily dose mini lessons are one minute or less and are designed to improve your grammar, conversations, and pronunciation. Fourth, all content is available on a convenient mobile app. You don't need a PC or tablet to learn during your daily commute. Instead, all of our lessons, tools, and resources are available 24-7 via our mobile app. That means you can access all of our audio lessons and other tools during your commute to work or anytime you have a few spare minutes. Fifth, audiobooks and other supplemental resources. In addition to the world's largest online collection of HD audio lessons, our language learning program has audiobooks to enhance your understanding and make it more convenient than ever to learn a language during your commute. The average commute time of most Americans is over 300 hours each year, and it's the perfect opportunity to learn and master a new language. Use the dead time during your daily commute to learn a new language and potentially boost your lifetime earnings. Whatever your motivation, our language learning program has the tools and resources necessary to help you learn a new language each year during your commute to and from work. So, if you're ready to finally learn a new language the fast, fun, and easy way, Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Signing up takes less than 30 seconds and you'll start speaking from your very first lesson. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them, maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Marvin James Mamorno. Hi Marvin. Marvin says, hello, I am from the Philippines. My question is with regard to the use of an and a. In a sentence, regularly we use an or a depending on the next vowel used. For example, an apple, a basketball game. 
But how about, for example, our, which has a vowel sound when you speak it, but is spelled with a consonant? Yeah, great question. So the question here is about using an and a、uh, when you have words that are spelled with consonant sounds but that are pronounced with vowels. Great point. So to refresh everyone's memory, we use an before vowel sounds and. A、uh, before consonant sounds. This is the rule, and the key in this rule is that sound is what's really important. So, in your example, you mentioned, for example, a basketball game. So, a basketball game. We have that b sound. That's a consonant sound. In your other example, our yes, it does start with an h on paper, which is a consonant. However, when we speak the sound, we say ow. Right. This is a vowel sound, and this is what really matters. This doesn't mean that every word that starts with H needs to take the an article. We need to think about how the word is pronounced. For example, if we take the word history, which begins with an H, we actually have to use a before it, not an, because the H in history is pronounced as a consonant. This is not true in your example of. Hour. So yes, as you've suggested, we do need to use that an article before words that have a vowel sound. So when you're writing something and you're not sure whether you should use a or an before the word, you need to take a second and try pronouncing that word. Does it begin with a vowel sound or does it begin with a consonant sound? If it starts with a consonant sound, use a. If it starts with a vowel sound, use. And so, our is a perfect example of this. Keep an eye out for this when you're writing. I hope that this answers your question. Thanks very much. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Wenceslas. Hi, Wenceslas. Wenceslas says, "Hi, Alicia. I'm Wenceslas from Benin in West Africa. Benin is a French-speaking country, but I work in English on an American program with American colleagues. We often use the words checking." And check in, and sometimes checking in. I'm confused. I know in one of your last lessons you explained the meaning of check in, but could you talk a little more about the difference between them? Sure. Okay. So our focus words here are checking, check in, and checking in. Yeah, we can use these three in very similar ways. For example, you might hear somebody say, "I'm just checking," or "I'm just checking on this thing," which means. I am currently in the process of confirming something, so we can use checking and confirming in work and in study situations to mean kind of the same thing. I want to confirm something, or I want to check the status of something. I want to learn any updates about something. So we can use checking to do that. So you might get a message from someone that says, "Just checking." This thing, or just checking on this thing, which means I would like to get an update about this thing. You also mentioned check in. To check in also means to get an update. You can think of this as a set phrase, a phrasal verb. To check in means, in this case, to get an update about something. So I want to check in. About this topic, I want to check in with you. So we typically follow check in with with. To mean a person, I want to check in with you. I want to check in with him. I want to check in with the project manager, or we use check in with about. For example, I want to check in about the project status, or I want to check in about this or that. So we typically follow check in with one of those two words, about or with. Finally, the last one that you asked about was checking in. You might see this used just as a short phrase in a message somewhere, like "Hey, your name, checking in," which means I just want to say hi, or I just want to send a message to remind you that I exist. That's kind of the feel of checking in. So it sounds like maybe you haven't heard from someone for a while, and you want to see how they are or how they're doing. You want a status update. Maybe you haven't heard from that person for a while, and you'd like a status update, or you'd like to get some information about what they're doing or what they're working on. You might get a message that says, "Hey, so and so, just checking in. I want to see what you're up to these days, or how is the project?" So we use checking in to do that. So checking, check in, and checking in all refer to this idea of getting an update about something or getting an update 
from someone. Yes, of course, there are other uses of checking and check in too. We can also use check as a verb to refer to confirming that something is correct. For example, can you check this paperwork? Or I need to check this paperwork. Or I had my paperwork checked and it seems it was okay. So this has kind of that feeling of confirming something, like confirming that everything is correct. So we also have this use of check, which means making sure things are correct. It depends on the context. So you need to take a look at the kind of messages you're getting from your coworkers or from other people in your life to determine whether they want an update from you or whether they're talking about making sure that something is correct. Aside from these topics, of course, check-in can also be used to refer to, for example, arriving at a hotel or arriving at an airport to confirm your registration or to confirm your reservation there. For example, let's check in at the airport two hours before the flight, or I checked in at my hotel this morning. So these words do have lots of different uses, as you can see, but depending on the context, you can quickly understand which one, hopefully, your coworkers or the other people in your life are talking about. So I hope that this helps clarify some of the differences between check, check in, and so on. I'll talk about one more use of check that might be kind of surprising. We use check as a noun. It means a form of payment where someone can write an amount on a piece of paper and give it to another person as payment for something or as a gift as well. This is called a check. So this is a noun. We don't say, I'm checking you or something like that. We can use this as a noun only. As a verb phrase, we say, I'm going to write a check for something. So this is perhaps a very American form of payment, something that's used in the US to pay for things, like to pay for rent perhaps, or to provide someone with a lot of money if they need to make a big purchase. So this is another type of check that is used in American English. And this might not be available in your country, or it might not be something that's used a lot in your country, but this is a very common type of payment in the USA. So you might not run into this word so much, but in case you do, that's what it means. So. I hope that this answer covers a lot of different uses of check in verb and noun forms. Thanks very much for sending along an interesting question and good luck with your work. Okay, let's go on to your next question. Next question comes from Margiano. Hello, Margiano. I hope I said your name right. Margiano says, hi, Alicia. When do we use no and when do we use not? I'm very confused. Okay, well, let's just break this down into very, very simple sentence structures. Of course, we can use no to reject something, to say, I don't want that, or I don't like that, right? We cannot use not in this way. We have to use no to reject something or say, we do not want something. But when we make larger sentences, like for example, with an adjective or with nouns and so on, we need to think about the differences between these two words. Let's start with not. We use not with adjectives. For example, we can make a sentence like, I am happy, right? Or I am sad. To make this sentence negative, we use not before the adjective. For example, I am not happy or I am not sad. We cannot use no in this way. That would become I am no happy or I am no sad. This is completely incorrect. We cannot use no in this way. So we use not before adjectives to make them negative. We also use not with verbs. For example, he eats dinner every day. Okay, great. But if we want to make that a negative sentence, we would say he does not eat dinner every day. We use not along with verbs to make the verb negative. We cannot use no in this way. For example, he does no eat dinner is incorrect. So we use not with adjectives and with verbs to make them negative. When we use no, we use it typically with nouns. When we want to talk about how much of something we have, we use this when we want to talk about having zero of something. For example, if I want to express that I have cookies in my house, I would say, I have cookies in my house, right? But if I wanted to express zero cookies in my house, I would say, I have no cookies in my house. So no comes before the noun cookies in this case. 
to express that I have zero of something. I could not say I have not cookies in my house. This is grammatically incorrect. Another example of this might be, I have time, like I have time for my projects or I have time for my hobbies. If I want to express I have zero time, I would use no before time. I have no time. I have no time for my projects or I have no time for my hobbies. This expresses I have zero time. I cannot use not in this position. I have not time is grammatically incorrect. So to recap really quickly, we use not to make verbs negative and to make adjectives negative, and we use no to reject things or say that we do not want them, and we also use no before nouns to express zero of something. So I hope that this quick guide helps you understand the basics of the differences between no and not. Thanks very much for the question. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. There's also a link in the description so you can find it there too to send me your questions. If you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again soon. Bye! In this video, you'll learn 10 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 2000 most common words and phrases in English. Each lesson will help you practice and review what you've learned. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard decks, and finally, master English. Okay, let's get started. First is allergy. 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 This word is a noun, and allergy is a negative reaction that you have to something else. So for example, people might have an allergy to a certain food, to a certain kind of plant, maybe to an animal. So this causes a reaction in the body. For example, maybe your eyes get really, really watery or you start to sneeze a lot. These are examples of allergies. For example, allergy to pollen, allergy to pollen. Allergy to pollen. Next is boarding pass. Boarding pass. Boarding pass. Okay, a boarding pass is a piece of paper or a digital pass that you can show to airline staff when you need to get on a plane. So a boarding pass includes your flight number, your seat number, probably the gate that your flight will take off from. So a boarding pass is necessary to get on a plane. For example, boarding pass for the flight. Boarding pass for the flight. Boarding pass for the flight. Next is education. 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 Okay, education is a noun. Education refers to the things that we learn, usually in school or as well in our lifetime. So when we talk about going to school, we talk about receiving education. So that's all of the different kinds of knowledge and the different experiences that we have as kids becoming adults. And then after that, we have other forms of education, other forms of knowledge that we get from books, from our jobs, from our hobbies, and so on. So there are many different ways to receive education or to get education. Here's an example phrase. Education and training. Education and training. Education and training. Next is English. 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 Okay, so English is the language that you are learning right now with this video. So English is a very interesting language. It pulls inspiration from many other languages and countries and cultures around the world. With English, we have kind of interesting spellings to think about, interesting ways to pronounce words, and there are many different dialects to consider in English as well. Here's an example sentence. Mr. Suzuki teaches English. Mr. Suzuki teaches English. Mr. Suzuki teaches English. Next is law. Law. 
law. So, law can refer to two different things. Law can refer to a country or a city or a state's rules. Their formal rules are called laws. And when we go to school to study those things because we want to become lawyers, we also refer to the study of those things as law. For example, law school, law school, law school. Next is Flute, flute, flute. So a flute is a musical instrument. A flute is played in this position. So we use our two hands next to our face to play the flute. It's a long kind of tube shaped instrument that makes a high pitched sound. This is very, very common in orchestras and in symphonies and in maybe high school bands as well. For example, silver flute. Silver flute. Silver flute. Okay, next is IT department. IT department. IT department. Okay, an IT department is a very, very common section in many companies and many organizations. The IT here stands for information technology. So usually the IT department is responsible for helping people with their computer problems, with other technology problems, media problems, and so on. For example, call the IT department. Call the IT department. Call the IT department. Next is business trip. Business trip. Business trip. A business trip is a trip that you take specifically for business. So that means it's different from a vacation. When you take a vacation, it's just for fun. When you have a business trip, you have to go somewhere for work. And maybe you have some fun while you're there also. But the main purpose of your travels is work or business. For example, go on a business trip. Go on a business trip. Go on a business trip. Next is marketing. 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 Marketing is another very common and very important section of many companies and organizations. Marketing refers to the process of creating things that will help sell products or sell goods and services to other people. So that can mean creating advertisements, it can mean writing things on a company website, and so on. For example, marketing department. Marketing department. Marketing department. Next is popular. 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 So popular means something that many people like. So when something is popular, that means that a lot of people think that it's really, really good. Be careful not to confuse popular and famous. When something is famous, it means many people know about it, or maybe many people know about a person. When something is popular, it means lots of people know about it and lots of people like it. So we can talk about people in this way, we can talk about places like restaurants, and we can also talk about things with the word popular. For example, popular man, popular man, popular man. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the medical condition when your body has a negative reaction to something outside of you? For example, dust or pollen or a specific food or maybe an animal. This is a noun. Allergy. Allergy. And how to say the piece of paper or the digital piece of paper you use to get on an airplane. Boarding pass. Boarding pass. What about the word we use to talk about the process of gaining knowledge, usually in school, but in work situations as well? Education. 
Education. Do you remember how to say the name of the language I'm speaking right now? English. English. Let's try the word we use to talk about the rules and regulations in a country or in a city. Law. Law. What about the word we use for the long musical instrument we play by holding it to the side of our bodies with this motion? Flute. Flute. Now, let's see if you remember how to describe the department or the section of a company or a school that helps people with their technical problems, like computers. IT department. IT department. Another one. What about the expression we use to talk about traveling somewhere for the purpose of a meeting or perhaps to give a presentation? Business trip. Business trip. Do you remember how to say the department that deals with sharing information about a product or service in order to get people to buy that thing? Marketing. Marketing. And finally, do you remember how to say the word that describes something that many, many people enjoy? Popular. Popular. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 10 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye! Being in planes, trains, and buses can be an uncomfortable experience for many people. Often there are small, cramped seats, not many things to do, and sometimes the experience is even scary. Despite this, you often see people working in these environments. How do they do it? In this video, you'll learn three tips to help you be able to study anywhere. The first one is adjust to your environment. Most of us would probably agree that a plane or a bus is not the best place to study. These environments are usually dark and cramped, and you may have a crying baby next to you. But the point is, there's never a perfect time or place to learn. The reality is that a lot of us use transportation every day. We face environments that are typically considered unsuitable for study. Trains get crowded. You can't do much in your car. Even in your own home, you'll get distracted by the TV or Facebook or something. And some days you'll be sick. You'll be tired. You'll have dinner plans. Once you accept that there's rarely such a thing as the perfect time to study, you can start thinking about how to make the best of the environment you have at that time. For example, if you ride a train, you might stand up for a long time. It might be difficult to focus on a book. In a case like this, you can use the Innovative Language 101 app to study, listen to the audio lessons, or do the word of the day by email. There are ways that you can learn in just about any situation. The point is, you need to adjust your study method to your environment. So take a look at your day and see where your time goes. Are there any gaps in between your activities where you feel like you can't study? And is there any way you can adjust? Two, take advantage of your limited time. We've surveyed tons of learners over the years, and every year we find that the number one reason most people don't learn a language is they say they have no time. But there's a chance you may have some spare time to study. You might just not recognize it yet. Let's say you commute for 30 minutes every day. You can ask yourself, how do I put these next 30 minutes to use? Or if you finish work at 7 p.m. and spend an hour doing nothing, you can think about what you might do in that hour that will help you work towards your goals. You don't have to use all 30 minutes of your commute or the full hour of your free time, but you can definitely fit in a short lesson or take other steps towards your goals. Three, have an on and off mindset. 
When you work, it can be really helpful to have a kind of on-off switch for when it's time to work and time to rest. You can apply the same idea to your language studies. When it's time to study, you can focus solely on that. You don't spend time thinking about doing it, you just do it. It doesn't matter where you are or what kind of studying you're doing, as long as it gets done. And when you're done with a lesson, reward yourself. It can be as simple as telling yourself, great job. When you're finished with the time you promised yourself for studies, feel free to focus on the next thing. In this video, we covered a few tips to help you study no matter where you are or how much time you have. It's all about having the right mindset. And for even more ways to study, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! In this video, you'll learn 10 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 2000 most common words and phrases in English. Each lesson will help you practice and review what you've learned. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard decks, and finally, master English. Okay, let's get started. First is accounting. 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 Accounting refers to keeping track of money. So in companies and organizations, there is usually an accounting department. It's a department of the company that is responsible for keeping track of money-related things. So where does the money go? Where are the receipts? What was the money used for? And so on. We also have personal accounting, where we track our own money. For example, accounting documents. Accounting documents. A count documents. Next is bonus. 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 A bonus means something extra. It means something that is not part of the original plan, and in many cases it refers to extra money. So if you receive a bonus from your job, for example, it means that you receive extra money at your job. You might also just get something called a bonus at something like an event or at a restaurant or maybe at some kind of concert that you go to where you receive something extra as a kind of gift. But usually this refers to money from work. For example, annual bonus. Annual bonus. Annual bonus. Next is light. 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 So there are a couple of different uses of the word light, but for this video, I want to focus on the one that refers to weight. So this light is the opposite of heavy. So something that is heavy weighs a lot. It's difficult to pick up. Something that is light does not weigh a lot. It's very easy to pick up. For example, light feather, light feather, light feather. Next is trombone. 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 A trombone is a very common musical instrument. This is a brass instrument. It's very unique in that it's played by moving a slide up and down to change the pitch of the instrument. For example, brass trombone. Brass trombone. Brass trombone. Next is departure. 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 So, departure refers to the time, usually, that you leave somewhere. We see this word a lot as part of a schedule. We can use departure with a time or a place to talk about the location or the time at which we leave some place. So, for example, departure date. Departure date. Departure date. Next is arrival. 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 Arrival refers to the opposite of departure. Departure means to leave someplace. Arrival means to come to someplace as your destination. So arrival can be used to talk about a schedule and it can also be used to talk about a location. For example, arrival gate. Arrival gate. Arrival gate. 
Next is violin. 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 A violin is a very common and very popular musical instrument. This is a string instrument that is small enough to be held in the hands next to the face. It's played by drawing a bow across the strings of the instrument. For example, play the violin. Play the violin. Play the violin. Earth science. Earth science. Earth science. Earth science is probably easy to guess. It is science that is related to the Earth. So the study of natural parts of our planet. So that can mean rocks and trees and nature and how the Earth moves and so on. All of these things are related to Earth science. Here's an example phrase. Earth science research. Earth science research. Earth science research. Next is science. 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 Science is a very, very big category of study. Science is related to the study of many different things in the world that are naturally occurring. So this could be people, it could be animals, it could be the planet and environment, it could be volcanoes, it could be space, it could be chemical reactions. These are all types of science. Here's an example phrase. Study of science. Study of science. Study of science. Next is prescription. 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 A prescription is something a doctor gives to you that you then take to a pharmacy to receive medicine. So in the past, we would receive a written prescription. The doctor would write the name of the medicine on a piece of paper and give it to us. Now some people might have digital prescriptions as well. You can take these to the pharmacy and receive the medication that you need. Here's an example phrase. Fill a prescription. Fill a prescription. Fill a prescription. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the department name that deals with money in a company? Accounting. Accounting. And how to say something extra that you receive. For example, extra money from your job or an extra product from a company. Bonus. Bonus. What about the word that is the opposite of heavy? Light. Light. Do you remember how to say the instrument that's made of brass that we play by moving a long arm up and down? Trombone. Trombone. Let's try the word that we use when we talk about leaving a place. We often use this noun before a time or a location where we leave. Departure. Departure. What about the word that we use to talk about when we come to a place? Again, just as with the previous word, we use this noun with time and location words. Arrival. Arrival. Now, let's see if you remember how to say the string instrument that you play by using a bow across the strings and you hold under your chin. Violin. Violin. Another one. What about the subject of study that's specifically about studying our planet in a scientific way?
Earth science. Earth science. Do you remember how to say the topic of study that deals with all kinds of different natural processes? For example, biology, chemistry, physics, and so on. Science. Science. And finally, do you remember how to say the medication you receive from a doctor after your doctor's appointment? Prescription. Prescription. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 10 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye! Are you struggling to understand conversations in your target language? This video will improve your listening skills using practice dialogues. How do you know if your language skills are improving? Our team of teachers have designed a free quiz to determine your actual learning level. So click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for you. In this lesson, you'll listen to a dialogue with the text. Second, you'll review the key vocabulary followed by the English translations. And finally, you'll review the dialogue with the text again to master what you learned. First, listen to the dialogue with the text on the screen. Have you ever landed in Chicago before? No, this is the first company I've worked for that flies to Chicago. Yeah, I worked for a company last year that serviced the Chicago area, but not Chicago. My mother still thinks that all major cities have all airlines available at all times. Yeah, the airline industry is certainly a unique one. Do you need a coffee? I was just thinking about that. That would be great, thanks. Now you'll hear the key vocabulary, followed by the English translation. Available. Not busy. Easy to get or use. Crew. A group of people who work on and operate some kind of ship. Service. The work performed by a person or people who serve. Company. A group of people or things, a business group. Major. Big. Very important. Industry. A group of businesses offering a particular service or product. Finally, let's review the dialogue again. See if you can understand more this time. Have you ever landed in Chicago before? No, this is the first company I've worked for that flies to Chicago. Yeah, I worked for a company last year that serviced the Chicago area, but not Chicago. My mother still thinks that all major cities have all airlines available at all times. Yeah, the airline industry is certainly a unique one. Do you need a coffee? I was just thinking about that. That would be great, thanks. This is the end of the lesson. In this lesson, you improved your listening and mastered key vocabulary for everyday life conversation. Don't forget to click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for your learning level. Keep practicing and move on to the next lesson. Expand your vocabulary with our core 2000 words ebook. 
It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone.